Buckle up, everyone. You are strapped in and ready for the Insurance Hour with me, your host, Carl Sussman, informing, educating, and entertaining Californians one policy at a time. This is Insurance Hour. Hello, hello. This is Insurance Hour, and I am your host, Carl Sussman. Thank you so much for being here today. We have an exciting show today. We have a studio guest that we're going to be talking with. Just so you know, also, phone lines are open, 559-656-0317. Or, of course, you can send your questions in to questions at insurancehour.com. If you need help right away, you can also shoot a text to 567 for carl and I will be able to help you right away. Without further ado, let me introduce our special guest today, Rachel Goldman. Rachel, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you. Rachel is, was a claims adjuster for a large insurance company. And I thought since we talk about claims so frequently, we talk about how it impacts your insurance premium, how it impacts your general relationship with the insurance carrier and how you feel about it. It would be a great idea to have somebody come in to talk about the claims experience from the claims adjuster uh, point of view. So that would be Rachel. And again, I appreciate you taking time to come in and chat with us today. Sure. No problem. In its most basic form, uh, you know, spell it out for us like we're stupid because it's not that far of a stretch. What, what does a claims adjuster do? Uh, basically, we get information about what happened in an accident or if there's just some damage to your car. And we figure out, in most cases, who's at fault. Um, if there's a you know, certain percentage on both sides, we figure that out and we resolve the claim and pay usually for the insured, for the, you know, for you, for your car, whatever damage. And then we pay the claimant or the other person or people that were involved in the accident with you um, based on the coverage on your claim. So we resolve the claims issue and uh, yeah. So you're, you're, you're the one that deals with the money and, and obviously doling it out to, to the necessary parties. I, I know before I get into some of the specifics, tell me a little bit about what your experience, did you deal with, auto claims primarily or property claims, a little bit of both. And how long did you do it? Just give us, give us a feel. Yeah. So most, almost everything that I dealt with was uh, dealing with auto claims. Um, I didn't do a lot of homeowners claims. They had different divisions that handled those things. Um, So mostly what I dealt with were uh, auto claims that were, um, that didn't involve attorneys. Um, There were other divisions that handled that, but there were some situations where they were fairly minor or cut and dry. Uh, where there was an attorney involved because people sometimes just feel they need to have one. Um, but uh, yeah, I did it for about 10 years. Um, and uh, yeah, they, they usually, the insurance companies, from what I understand, have different divisions within the claims departments that handles the different specific uh, policy coverage areas. So it, as a claims adjuster, is it your responsibility to decide things like, I'm, I'm talking about things that people are always complaining about, so you, luck, mm-hmm. lucky you. Do, are you the one that decides if it's their fault, not their fault, and, and whether they're going to be getting a surcharge potentially on their policy if it is their fault? Is that within you the purview of a claims adjuster? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that's, that's usually the part that people don't like, you know, hearing the most. Um, you know, we are all sorts of, you know, when they'll call, they'll, they'll, some of them will immediately launch into why it wasn't their fault and try to spin it in a way so that, you know, that's the first thing you hear is it wasn't my fault. Um, but yeah, ultimately we're the ones that make that decision. Um, and then, yeah, well, we don't assign the surcharges or anything like that. We do, you know, let them know, uh, that, you know, if, based on the percentage and different carriers, I'm sure do this different ways, but based on the percentage you are found to be at fault, um, that's going to impact your insurance rate um, and any surcharges. Sometimes it's not necessarily a, uh, an increase in the overall rate, but you might lose a good driver discount. Um, if you've now had a claim or an accident, you're no longer considered a good driver. So um, things like that can cause the policies to, to go up in cost. This is the stuff that I love to hear about. So pe- <laughs> the first thing out of their mouth is it's not, it's not their fault. And as you probably know better than, than I do, it sometimes is their fault. And yeah. at, at what point in the process do you actually have to make that determination? Do you make that sort of mentally right away? Do you pretty much have an idea or do you do you wait through the process to see what you're finding out or what, what's the, what's going on in your mind? I mean, it depends on the type of claim. If it's someone that's rear-ended or there's like only one car that's involved, you know, 
people will still believe it or not, like run into a pole um, or, you know, back into something and say, but it wasn't my fault because it wasn't, you know, painted a bright enough yellow or, you know, I, I dropped my phone and then I ran into whatever. It's like, well, that is your fault. I mean, you know, you can't, it has to be someone's fault. It's unless it's something random falling out of the sky that, you know, it's, it's going to be your fault. Um, but yeah, I mean, one of the things people will say that kind of would trap them in a way that's probably not the right, right word to use, but they kind of get themselves in, into hot water right off the bat is when they're explaining what happened. Like if there's a left turn, they'll literally say, I saw the person coming. They were going really, really fast. And I tried to turn and I, you know, and they hit me and to which, you know, you have to not sarcastically say, well, if you saw them going fast, why on earth would you have turned in front of them? Um, you know, that that's the type of thing that they'll say. They'll try to blame the other person before you even really know exactly what happened. But in doing that, they kind of throw themselves under the bus without realizing it. Interesting. And I, I know people that are paying attention are saying, well, wait a minute, you're their insurance company, right? These are these are clients of the carrier that you're you know handling the claim for. So um, do you what what is your goal to try and show they're at fault so the carrier can charge more money or is your goal do you have is there some incentive i guess is the right way to ask is there an incentive for you to decide if someone is at fault or not or does it not make a difference at all to your job no it doesn't make a difference to my job um but yeah people definitely feel that way you know and and sometimes even um you know from people that i know that handle homeowners claims too you know, the goal when you get into it's a gamble, right? Like you're paying for something that you hope you never have to use. So when there's a situation that comes up where you need to use it, usually what people will think is, well, I've been paying you all this time. Like, what have I been paying you for? If now I have to pay you even more, you know, you should be on my side. Um, they look at it like it's more of like a savings account, you know, or something like that, where it's like, well, I've been giving you thousands of dollars for 20 years and now I run into a poll and you're going to charge me for that. I understand, you know, where that, why that makes sense to them, but that's unfortunately not the way it works. So I want to talk a little bit more about that perception and also the mechanics of, of how many claims you're handling at a time and how you keep up with all that stuff. We're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, well, let's, let's touch base on some of those issues as well. Again, if you're just jumping in, this is Insurance Hour. I'm your host, Carl Sussman. We have special guest today, Rachel Goldman, who has been handling claims in her past life for an insurance company. Take a quick break and we'll be back. Remember, the phone lines are open at 559-656-0317. Hang in there. We will be back in a flash. Let's talk about earthquakes for a minute. Look, we know we live in earthquake country here in California. Powerful, devastating earthquakes have happened here before, and science says that they will happen again. They can't tell us exactly when. They can just tell us that it is going to happen. Count on it. Prepare for it. Did you know that earthquakes are not covered by your homeowner's insurance policy? You need a separate policy to give you the peace of mind that you will be able to recover without getting financially wiped out the next time we get hit with a big one. There is a great company here in California that will provide you with earthquake coverage you need at a price you can afford. That company is GeoVera. I have a policy through GeoVera. I really like how easy it is to choose from all of their great coverage options, backed by the financial strength that lets me know that they will be here for me when I need them the most. Go to getquake.com forward slash insurance hour to learn more. That's getquake.com slash insurance hour. Make sure you're ready for the day when the ground shakes again. Hello, hello. This is Insurance Hour. I'm your host, Carl Sussman. Thank you so much for being here today. Remember, the phone lines are open at 559-656-0317. You can also send your questions in to questions at insurancehour.com. If you need help right away, you can also send a text to 567-4-CARL. Remember, it's Carl with a K. Today, we have special guest Rachel Goldman, who has spent, I say her previous life because she's not doing it anymore. <laughs> handling claims for an insurance company. And we want to talk a little bit more about that process. Rachel, before the break, we were talking about what mm -hmm. client's perception is, uh, that uh, you know they're putting money in and that you should just automatically be paying money out you know, if they put in more money during that time. But stepping away from the obvious that these are not savings accounts, they're insurance policies. When you're handling claims, how many people are you dealing with 
on average at a given time? How many claims do you have? How many that you're working on? You know, it, it really depends. I mean, I, I don't want to say it's seasonal because, you know, there's different types of claims that we see more of, like when it's raining, especially in Southern California, where people aren't exactly sure how to drive in the rain yet. Um, you know, we might get more accidents, you know, um, of rear end or of rear end accidents because people are not, you know, leaving enough distance. Um, on average, when I was doing this, we would have anywhere from, you know, uh, 50 pending claims, sometimes, you know, closer to like 80 to 100. But once you get that many, it's very, very challenging to try to mediate all of them. I mean, it's not the right word, but to monitor them and actually handle them effectively. And, you know, that you are, there is some pressure to kind of, you know, get through them as quickly as possible. Um, and a lot of the reasons you, you might see uh, adjusters that have a higher pending number of claims, it's just kind of the luck of the draw. You have people that you have to reach out to and get statements from and connect with and set up, you know, appointments for inspections for. And you're kind of at the mercy of those people as to when they're going to get back to you. Uh, how long is it going to take for the shop or the, you know, uh, damage inspector to see the car? All of those things can kind of drag the process out. Um, so a, a rule that I had was if I when I would come in in the morning, I would pick up whichever file I left off with the day before. And you do everything you possibly can do at that moment to get everything done. And then you put it back and then you kind of move on to the next one. Um, so depending, there are times where I would only have like 30 or 40 claims pending at a time. There were other times where you would be pushing 100 and it was, you know, d depending on the, again, the, the number of claims that other coworkers had in the office, sometimes they would take a few, pass them off to someone else to kind of like balance things out. Um, but yeah, on average, I would say between like uh, 40 and 70, depending on, on what was going wow. on. That just yeah. sounds, I mean, I don't, I don't know what I was expecting, but I was not expecting numbers that high. That oh, yeah. seems insurmountable to be able to keep track of. How, mm -hmm. what type of system do you use to try and keep track of what someone said or what's happening or at what stage the process is? Everything is, I mean, again, when I was doing this, it was still pretty old school. We were using computers, but it wasn't like now. Um, so the only way we communicated with people basically was by phone. Um, when you would take statements, they would be recorded statements. And we would have like a tape recorder on your desk that was somehow, you know, connected to the phone. So when you would get that person on the phone, you would try to get every possible thing you needed from them at that moment. So if you if you knew it was a little more complicated, if there are multiple cars involved, um, you know, you would want to get that statement as soon as you possibly could, because you never knew after that conversation when you might be able to reach that person again. Um and, uh, you know, it, it would be finish this one, do whatever you could reach this person. I had an actual paper calendar on my desk that I would kind of write things like who to follow up with. Now, obviously there's different systems on the computer that you could use to remind you to go back and follow up. Um, you know, and with emails, you know, you just kind of send yourself reminders to keep following up. It sounds like there should be some very clear system in place. And again, there may be now, um, I, I don't know, but at the time I did it, there was no, it was basically up to you. And like everyone had their own kind of organizational skills and how they would do it, whatever works for you would hopefully work best. Um, but most of the time it was really up, you were up to the mercy of the people you were dealing with, um, you know, and hope that they were responsive and, and you could get everything you needed in a timely fashion. Would you say that, and again, I'm still, my mind is still blown thinking that there could be 50 or 60 pending claims that you're working on in one, in any given time. How do you remember what the claims are even about or what information they might have said? And if, if stories start changing or, or things like that, I mean, do you have, it seems like you could almost spend half the day just trying to get caught up on where you left off before you continue moving forward. Well, documenting everything is like is critical because there are cases where you might talk to someone today and let's just say they're not able to give you their statement. Their their only goal was just to get the claim reported and say, OK, we need to schedule something, you know, next week. Well, between that first conversation and a week or a couple of days, sometimes there might all of a sudden get an attorney, you know, would become involved. Um, and then it would actually most of the time get passed off to a different department that would just deal with 
um, with claims that involved attorney representation. Um, but you, everything was always very, very clearly documented, or it should have been very clearly documented to the conversations, to the dates, to what you had suggested, to what they responded with. The goal being, if that claim is passed off to someone, whether it's because of an attorney or um, an outside adjuster becoming involved, anybody should be able to pick that up and look and see what happened. You know, very easily kind of scroll through and say, okay, I see what happened on this day and this day. Because people do change their stories, you know, or sometimes because they've actually forgotten, but also sometimes because they've talked to their friend or their neighbor. Well, you didn't tell them it was your fault, did you? And it's like, well, you know, but you did tell me that, you know, on this such and such day when you admitted you dropped your phone and ran into the back of this person. Now, all of a sudden, you know, they cut you off, you know, so it's it's important. Are you saying that people lie? Their stories change. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, they think things through. And and usually that's why it's it's important to get as much as you can in that first that first conversation because they're the most raw, they're the most they're also usually the most fired up and emotional about everything. But, you know, if they have any remorse and they know what they did, um or the reverse, you know, we have people that haven't wanted to report the claim to us as their own carrier because they want the person that hit them to be the one and in getting involved and in taking care of it. But that doesn't always happen as quickly as it should. So they're very, um, like they'll call and say, I just want to let you know, but I don't want you to do anything because I'm waiting for this other, you know, whoever to take care of it for me and days go by and weeks go by and they're getting very frustrated. It's like, well, that's what you pay us for. But then that's when things can become complicated and tricky because of, of rates. And is it, you know, do you get a surcharge because you just reported the claim? What if I just tell you this happened and then I don't tell you anything else? You know, we'll hey, hold that away. thought. I want to talk more about that and about the attorney's involvement and how that might change the process. We'll take a quick break and we'll be back with our special guest, Rachel Goldman. Stand by. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, in just a few moments, the window to the magic podcast show will begin. My name is Patrick. My name is Calvin. I'm Mouseketeer Greg. My name is Paul, and I will be your guide through the wonderful world of Disney sound experiences. This show is a weekly trip into the world of the Disney theme parks and resorts. And this is the place where you get to use your ears to surround yourself with the magic. For your safety, please remain seated while listening to the Window to the Magic.com podcast. Maybe there's a name for this. Something like Disnotic Obsession. Please visit windowtothemagic.com for more information, or you can find us on Apple Podcasts and in the iHeartMedia app. Hello, hello. This is Insurance Hour. I am your host, Carl Sussman. Thank you so much for being here today. We are talking about claims. Remember, the phone lines are open at 559-656-0317. Also, you can send your questions in to questions at insurancehour.com. To get help right away, just shoot a text to 567 for carl Carl with a K, and we will get back to you right away. Before the break, we are talking with Rachel Goldman, our special guest and claims extraordinaire. And it seems that we have a, a, something that keeps coming up called attorneys and how the process of handling claims can change once there's an attorney that gets involved, for better or for worse. Rachel, explain how that works if you're dealing with a claim with a client versus if they get an attorney and, and how that process may or may not impact the claim. So, again, I'm sure this depends on the carrier and things may have changed, but probably not that much. Once you find out that there's an attorney involved and someone's, you know, obtained representation, um, even before we get a letter, you know, confirming or an email confirming that I'm now representing this person, um, we can no longer talk to that person. They are now, you know, we, we can't communicate with them directly. We have to go through the attorney. Um, so that in itself changes the nature of how we handle the claim. It's going to most likely take a little bit longer Um, you know, we're now, if we want to take a statement a recorded statement from the person, we have to make sure that it is a, um, like a conference call or a situation where the attorney is also on the line with them. So now you have two different schedules to coordinate with and not just one. Um, it does tend to just be more time consuming 
And so they, they will tend to, you know, transfer those to a different unit. And sometimes those people may not have as many cases pending because if their claims are literally going to take longer because of the more, more things that are involved. Um, those claims, those claims, you know, may go to, you know, um, to be mitigated. They may go to, um, an arbitration. All of those processes take longer and it's just a different track that they the claims are put onto. Um, but, uh, there are also some cases where, uh, I remember there was someone I used to work with that was, had worked for the company for many, many years and eventually ended up in our fraud unit. And, uh, the attorneys would, uh, you know, sign on to a person. And then once they would get a uh, notification of who the adjuster was, because they were already, this person kind of made a name for themselves as being very, very, um, you know, litigious and understanding how the, the process worked and was very good at sniffing out things that may not be completely kosher. Um, a lot of the attorneys would drop the cases. They'd be like, this isn't worth my time. The, you know, the case that my client brought to me isn't really that strong. You know, there might be some red flags that the attorney has, but they're just kind of rolling the dice and saying, maybe I can make a few extra bucks. Not saying all attorneys are that way. There are some cases where absolutely it is beneficial to get one um, because it is a complicated process. And depending on the type of accident that's occurred, it, it, it's a lot and it can be overwhelming. So, um, but it, it does change the nature of how the claim is handled and um, who's going to be handling it and how long it's going to take to settle. And you may not end up with as much money because if you are legitimately going to be receiving a settlement of any kind, um, someone's got to pay the attorney and it's not, you know, and it's going to be you. So whatever your settlement is, if you can manage it on your own, I know this is kind of off topic, but if you can handle it on your own, the adjusters are not trying to, you know, cheat you out of anything. They're literally trying to handle things in the most, you know, in, in the most legal, uh, but in the right way, they're trying to do the right thing and give you what you deserve to have. You may not be end up with any more money as a settlement amount, but you may end up with less in your pocket because now instead of you just getting the ten grand for, uh, for example, on your own, now you have to pay ten or fifteen percent of that to the attorney. So sometimes it kind of backfires. But I'm not dissuading people from getting an attorney, but should just be aware that that that's a that happens. In your experience, are what are some times when you said sometimes it makes it makes sense because the process can be complicated? Oh. Do you have any obvious uh, times or situations that you can point out where someone might be filing a claim and you're thinking, wow, they really should have an attorney? Or uh -huh. are there any specifics that you can give for people to keep in mind when it may make sense to be looking for representation versus not? Yeah, there's actually one. Um that very that's very clear in my head it was actually uh uh well it was two car it was a car and a semi truck um uh, the insured was a passenger a uh, friend was driving the car uh the friend fell asleep while she was driving the car and went off the road overcorrected and ended up slamming into the you know left rear end of a semi truck on the 5 freeway um it was, it was a very, very serious accident. Um, the passenger who was our insured was very seriously injured. Um, had he not been laying back in his seat reclining, he probably would have been killed uh, because of the, the force of the impact. In that case, the insured was going, going after, sounds aggressive, but he was making a claim against the owner of the car that he was in. He was not at fault. He was a passenger. She was clearly at fault for falling asleep and hitting a truck. Um, and the car was owned by her parents. Her parents did have insurance on the car, but they also didn't have enough insurance on the car. They were underinsured. And to make it even more exciting, they were not, they, they were underinsured. They owned a restaurant in Southern California that had been very well established. They were very well off. They made, they, they were intentionally not paying what they should have been to cover themselves in the event of something like this happening. Um, our insurer was not able to really deal with what was involved at that point. There, an attorney got involved. They had to review the assets of the, of the parents or the people that owned the car. They had to do a whole assessment of the value of this restaurant, this establishment, to see where, if there was any other money that could be gotten for our insured because he needed more to just cover medical bills, forget 
you know, pain and suffering or anything like that. It was just to cover medical bills. He needed more money than their policy was covering. So in that type of a situation, um, it's definitely, it was definitely, I would say necessary to have an attorney because there's no way an individual with no knowledge of how the claims process works or investigating someone's assets, you know, or evaluating the, the value of a business, you, that's not something just a layman could do on their own. So complicated claims, claims that involve potential large injuries or large medical payments or uh, people that are underinsured, things that are outside of the, the, of the average person's yeah. knowledge, right? What, what the average mm-hmm. person would know, then you're saying it makes sense to, to potentially be looking for representation. I want to talk a little bit more about that after we take another quick break. And I think it's interesting to, that you mentioned that this is an accident that where somebody was underinsured because we talk about that a great deal on the show. People ask, how much insurance do you need? And that's always the magic question, right? You need as much as you need when there's a claim. But okay. let's talk a little bit more about that when we come back. Again, our special guest today, we have Rachel Goldman, former claims adjuster extraordinaire, <laughs> and we will be back after a quick break. Stand by. Do you need homeowner's insurance? Has your previous insurance company left the state, non-renewed your policy, or maybe they just raised your premium to an amount that you simply can't afford? Whatever the situation, we can help. Just dial pound 250 on your cell phone and say keyword insurance quote, and we will connect you with an agent who can assist you right away. Or if you prefer, you can visit us online at insurancehour.com forward slash quotes. Whether you're looking for homeowner's insurance or auto insurance, we'll send the best options straight to you. So what are you waiting for? Simply dial pound 250 and say keyword insurance quote, and we will connect you with a live agent to help provide competitive quotes for your homeowner's insurance or auto insurance. Don't get caught unprepared. Insure what matters with an insurance company you can trust and with a premium that you can afford. Don't put off until tomorrow what you should have done yesterday. Simply dial pound 250 on your cell phone and say keyword insurance quote. Hello, hello. This is Insurance Hour. I am your host, Carl Sussman. Thank you so much for being here today. Phone lines are open, 559-656-0317. Send your questions in to questions at insurancehour.com. If you need help right away, you can shoot us a text at 567 for carl Carl with a K. Today, we have a very special guest, Rachel Goldman, and we've been talking about claims. She has many years of experience in claims. If you've missed any part of this show, you don't want to, make sure you jump online go find out where it is so you can watch the first part, listen to the first part. You can find us on all the podcasts, on YouTube, on iHeartRadio, Spotify, wherever you want. Just search for Insurance Hour and you'll find us. So Rachel, before the break, we were talking about a a large claim and then getting, having an attorney get involved. And and it, it brings a question to my mind and I'm sure other people, when you're dealing with your claims adjuster, with your insurance company, whose side are they on? Who are they representing? Uh, they're representing, the, I mean, they're representing the insured. They're we're representing you, but we also have there. We have to represent the law and the coverage, you know, the policy coverage. Um, you know, which everyone is given when they get the insurance policy. Um, you know, it's not. It doesn't always seem that way. Um, you know, it's it's great when you're not at fault and you know they're very happy, but um, you know. There are there are a lot of times where they don't it doesn't come across that way. Um, and, uh, you know, that the, it's a shame that people kind of have the the preconceived idea of how the claim is going to go uh, before they even get started. Um, you know, it's it's probably one of the few professions where, you know, when you answer the phone, you're not going to get someone just calling in a happy mood. You know, it's not like they're calling to you know, order flowers for their girlfriend or, you know, something like that. They're something bad has happened, something that they're not used to, something that they they are assuming is going to cost them money. It's going to they're inconvenienced. You know, they're upset. They might be upset because someone's hurt or scared. They don't know what's going to happen. So it's you you really do kind of have to um, settle yourself, you know, and you answer the phone and try to keep a clear, clear head and make sure that you're explaining the process to the insured when they call um, that, you know, we're going to, we're going to do this the way 
we have to do this. It's not, we're not on anyone's side. We're not even on the company's side. We're on this, you know, we're looking at the facts in front of us and making a decision based on what actually happened. And then looking at what kind of coverage do we have you know, to work with to then to settle it and to hopefully make everybody whole again. So do claims adjusters keep copies of the policies and reference them? Is that part of the part of the job description for them to actually look at the policy and see is there coverage? Is there not? Yeah. I mean, on, it, it should if for individuals. It'll pop up automatically. Like you pull up the, the person who's insured with you and it'll tell you right there, like how much coverage they have, what their deductibles are. Um, you know, you can look and see if they've had past claims, um, as far as having knowledge of the policies. Yeah. I mean, you're expected to know what's covered and what's not. There's always exceptions to that, or there might be some weird situation that happens that we're not clear on. So, you know, of course we can reference the actual policy or speak with a supervisor. Um, you know, sometimes we would have meetings, uh, you know, like within our own unit to kind of like workshop, you know, certain claim situations. If we were kind of like, well, I don't know, this happened or that happened. Do you think this and that? So there's there's still a very human element involved. We're not at the point where you can just get online and unless, you know, a rock hit your windshield, which is a whole different situation. Um, you know, there's a human element involved. And, and there are some, you know, people that try to like sway your opinion on what happened. But ultimately, we have to be very unbiased and just look at the facts that are how the accident happened, and then hopefully the coverage is there to, to take care of uh, to care the damages. How important would you say it is for people with the relationship they establish with their with the claims adjuster? Because again, you're you're a person, uh, mm. and and as you as you so eloquently point out, people are not calling in a good mood. They're calling mm. because something bad has happened. How yeah. important would you say it is to the overall process, the attitude, and the way that the person is dealing with you is it's important from a human standpoint you know i mean everyone is doing a job and no one likes to have a job where you immediately are seen as you know someone that um uh that's going to be doing something bad you know i mean it's 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 just kind of the, the right thing to do when you pick up the phone to be kind um does it impact the job and how we settle the claim it shouldn't um, you know, it shouldn't affect the outcome. I would I would be lying if I said there weren't some people that were really, really obnoxious that, you know, maybe when I was supposed to be following up with that person on Tuesday and I remember the conversation that where they were yelling and screaming and hung up on me, that file may go to the bottom of the pile and take another day or two, which, you know, that comes down to more like ethics. But you know, we are people. It, it's not like, um, you know, we can just kind of put all that out of our heads. It's very stressful. Um, and so it does, it goes a long way just in the whole process of the claim. It's like the outcome is ultimately going to be the same. We start at A, we're going to end at Z. It's really up to you when you call and make a claim to determine the the tone and the, the climate of how that claim is going to be handled. It can be relatively pleasant for you or you can pick up the phone and decide this is just going to be a real nightmare every single time i talk to this person it doesn't have to be so that's 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 how i feel about that and it's it, going it, it's and it's the right thing to do <laughs> to not call with an attitude all of a sudden well the human element's obviously there what happens when you're dealing with somebody other than your client other than the insured of of the insurance company you represent how does that differ for me, it didn't really differ at all. Um, some because again, this is still a person. It could most of those situations where where the person calling the claimant um, wasn't at fault for the accident. Most of the time, um, you know, they were the ones that were ended, and I completely understand. If someone ran into my car while I'm just at a stop sign, I wouldn't want to involve my insurance company either because there's that fear factor of just by nature of having a claim reported, even if it was opened and closed within 10 minutes, there's that mark that shows up on your record. And you just never really know as, you know, just a, a layman, if that's going to impact your policy or not and the premiums on it. Um, so if it's, if it, whoever does it's calling, I would always treat them the same exact way. But of course we have to explain, we can take your statement now, we can set up the appointment to see your car now, but we can't settle anything. We can't do anything as far as paying you 
or getting you into a rental car or anything like that until we've talked to our insured and we see what happened. So that in that situation, we are representing our insured because again, you know, if you're paying me to represent you and to, to cover your car, how would that be if, you know, before I even talk to you on the phone, like, oh, we already took care of that. That person's you're like, well, well, wait a minute. You know, you haven't even asked me what happened yet. You know, let's talk a little bit more about third parties or when they're calling in second parties. And w- when we come back, because I want to get your take on that. We will be right back with special guest Rachel Goldman. This is Insurance Hour. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, in just a few moments, the window to the Magic Podcast Show will begin. My name is Patrick. My name is Calvin. I'm Mouseketeer Gray. My name is Paul, and I will be your guide through the wonderful world of Disney sound experiences. This show is a weekly trip into the world of the Disney theme parks and resorts. And this is the place where you get to use your ears to surround yourself with the magic. For your safety, please remain seated while listening to the Window to the Magic.com podcast. Maybe there's a name for this. Something like Disnotic Obsession. Please visit windowtothemagic.com for more information, or you can find us on Apple Podcasts and in the iHeartMedia app. Hello, hello. This is Insurance Hour. I am your host, Carl Sussman. Thank you so much for being here today. We have the phone line still open. You can call or text 559-656-0317. Send your questions in to questions at insurancehour.com. If you need somebody right now, you can also send a text to 567-4-CARL, K-A-R-L, and we will text you back right away. We have our special guest, Rachel Goldman, here today, Claims Adjuster Extraordinaire. I've decided that's going to be your title. Claims Adjuster Extraordinaire. (laughs) And we're talking all things claims, and you don't want to have missed any of this. So if if you're just jumping in, go online, search for Insurance Hour, find us, because you want to make sure you get the beginning of the show as well. Lots of interesting information here. Rachel, before the break, we were talking about someone other than your insured, right? Somebody other than the person that's paying premium to the company that you're working for. It's a long, mm-hmm. s- long stream, but yeah. you see what I'm saying. Yeah. What is it like and how does it work when you get a phone call from someone other than our, your client, your insured, that wants to make a claim or wants to start demanding money? Um, you treat them the same way as you would the insured, except that we have to first before we pay anything, we obviously need to talk to our insured. We need to talk to you. We need to see what is it that happened in the accident. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll explain that to the person. If we'll take their statement, if we need to, we'll set up an inspection time to see their car, either to go out or to have them come in. However, however the carriers work. Um, and we'll let them know, you know, we are going to now do this and this and this, we're going to talk to our insured. We're going to do the same thing we did with you. We're going to do with them and then we will get back to you and let you know if everything is fine and the coverage is in in effect and there's enough coverage to take care of everything. Then we will, you know, pay for your damages and and go from there. Um, Most of the time, it's a logical response. They understand. Um, Every so often, there are people that don't want to wait and they just they don't understand, like, why we can't just do it. Um, It it, again, depending on the complexity of the accident, um, those those instances actually tend to be more when it is a cut and dry type of an accident. Like you were in somebody and the person that you hit doesn't understand why it's so obvious. They, you know, it's my back bumper, their front bumper. Why can't you just pay to fix my car? Well, because believe it or not, people sometimes back up <laughs> and hit the person behind them. Um, you know, they said, Oh, I needed to be over there, not here. And they don't look um, there's all. And it's also just kind of common courtesy that you're going to talk to the person who is your customer first and then, you know, finalize everything with third party. Um, But again, those are cases where if you are on the other side, you still should be patient with that person. You're still talking to a human being who has a job to do, like most likely you have a job to do and no one likes to be rushed or told how to do their jobs. Um, chances are the person you're talking to, the adjuster has been doing what they're doing a lot longer than you have, and they, they have a job to do. There's a process they have to follow. 
So, you know, we just ask again, be kind, be polite, be polite, be patient and understand, you know, you can always go back through your own insurance company if you're in a hurry and they can fix your car possibly faster than we could do it. And then they would just do what's called, um, uh, gosh, I'm like completely subrogation. Subrogation. Thank you. I was going to say reciprocation, subrogate (laughs) and get the money back from your insurance company. Again, you don't have to deal with that process, but no one wants to do that if they know for sure that I'm not at fault. But you brought up rear ending accidents because I get asked this with, with quite a bit of frequency is, is it ever not your fault if you rear end somebody? And you've already given us an example that I never thought of, that someone would just randomly be stopped and put it in reverse and back up into you. That mm-hmm. actually happens? It happens. It actually happens. I know someone else that that happened to. Yeah, it happens. I mean, you've seen that before. You've been, how, you've been sitting at a red light, and all of a sudden the person in front of you, the you know reverse lights go on, and you're like, what are they going to do right now? You know, they're just they're backing up because they've they, they sometimes they're just making room for someone in the crosswalk. That can happen. Sometimes they're just like, oh, shoot, I meant to be, I need to be in that lane. And they're just frazzled if they don't know where they are. They're just not paying attention and they just throw it into reverse and hit you. Um, You know, luckily, a lot of those cases, it's not like a major impact because you're coming from a complete stop and you can only go so fast in that short span of time, that, that short space, but it's still damage to the car, but it does happen for sure. Other or than, there's cases where you might get pushed. Some there might be three cars. There might be someone in the back that hits someone behind you, and then they get pushed into you, and that can be a little trickier because you know the person in the middle may have actually hit you first, but now they're saying no, it was the person behind me that pushed me into you, and and it just it just kind of snowballs. I had, that's another one I hadn't thought of. So there's yeah. two two ways that you can actually rear in someone and it's not your fault. You could be, again, generally speaking, you could yeah. be pushed into them or have somebody back up into you. Yeah. Is there, you hear people will talk about, oh, they slammed on their brakes for no reason, things like that. They were going, to, they were going too fast. They were going too slow. What What's the general, and again, I know that every case, you know, every file is looked at individually, but can you speak a little bit about how that works? If somebody says, you know, yeah, you rear they rear-ended them, but, you know, they stopped unexpectedly or they were going too slow or they were doing something. What are some of the things you would hear? Um, those, we would hear that a lot that, you know, they just stopped. I don't know why they stopped or they didn't have to stop. The light was still yellow. You know, why did they stop? Um, I didn't see anything. They said there was a, you know, a, a dog in the road or a cat or something like that. A number of things that they can say. The bottom line is in those cases, and specifically if you're admitting that, yeah, I ran into this person, I did this, but it wasn't my fault because they just, we're just driving along and all of a sudden they slammed on their brakes. It's going to be your fault 99% of the time because you always need to be traveling at a safe distance based on your speed and the weather conditions and the road conditions so that you can stop if the person in front of you stops. In a way, if you look at it like, okay, I think they tell you when you're getting your driver's license, if you see an animal in the road, you just need to hit that sucker and keep on going, you know, which is horrible. But that's what they say, because it's also dangerous just to slam on your brakes in general. There's a lot of other things that could happen in doing that. You could lose control of your car and careen off into something else. They, you know, if you pretend that cat or whatever is a kid it kind of changes the perspective a little bit. Would you say if you were ended someone that suddenly stopped because a, uh, you know, a five-year-old ran into the street to get a ball, what did you stop for? There was no reason for you to stop. You know, it's, everyone has a different perspective on the reason for coming to a, a screeching stop, you know? So you can't judge someone for stopping for a dog versus stopping for a child or, you know, a, a, anyone that just happens to be in the street. Um, there are cases though, which kind of gets into more of the fraud situation where people do slam on their brakes for no reason, that swoop and squat where there will be people that will be doing this intentionally. And there, that does happen, unfortunately, way too often. And that's a whole other subject. Let's talk a little bit about that, but then I want to hear some of your favorite stories as soon as we come back again, uh, we have Rachel Goldman claims extraordinaire and we'll be right back. 
Are you feeling lost in the search for the right insurance? Making call after call, only to find no one willing to go that extra mile for you? At Sussman Insurance Agency, we understand that frustration, and we're here to change your experience. Where others see obstacles, we see opportunities. While many might shy away from jumping through hoops, at Sussman Insurance Agency, we are prepared to leap. Looking under every rock, exploring every avenue, that's not just what we do, it's who we are. Our dedicated team doesn't just offer policies, we provide solutions. Solutions born from persistence, expertise, and a genuine commitment to finding you the best coverage possible. We don't just meet expectations, we surpass them. If you're tired of hearing no or it's not possible, it's time to turn to a team that believes in yes and let's make it happen. Don't settle for less. Reach out to Sussman Insurance Agency at 877-411-5200. Visit us online at sussmaninsurance.com or email sales at sussmaninsurance.com. Let's uncover the insurance solutions you deserve. Sussman Insurance Agency, going the extra mile every time. Hello, hello. This is Carl Sussman, and this is Insurance Hour. Thank you so much for being here. We have our special guest, Rachel Goldman, is here. We are talking about claims. Great conversation. If you've missed any of it, jump online, search for Insurance Hour, find us, find this show, and be sure to listen to all of it because you will learn a lot and get some interesting insight on claims as well. Rachel, in our final segment, I wanted to get some some stories from you. Uh, you, you mentioned something right before the break, a swoop and sco- stop or, or something. Get, yeah. t- this is insurance fraud. Tell us a little bit about what your experience is and what that even means. So basically what that means is uh, these are people that are committing insurance fraud and they are intentionally trying to get rear-ended they almost always have an attorney already representing them. Probably not a very, a very uh, upstanding attorney, you know, to be handling those types of cases. They tend to have an uh, an older vehicle, uh, more than two or three passengers in the car. They will stuff the car full of people so that there's that many more people that can claim they were hurt because they're really not interested in getting the car fixed. That's not even like their 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 main target is to just get money for being hurt for being hit so sometimes there's more than one car they'll kind of like box you in and then to kind of distract you and then another one will swoop or cut in front of you and then slam on their brakes and you'll run into them um and they will have the car stuffed with people and then before you even have a chance to know what happened there's audit there's an attorney involved from the onset of the claim um and Usually those claims uh, will go immediately to a fraud department of sorts. And in some cases, the attorneys will be very familiar with the adjusters that they're dealing with. um, And they may drop the case altogether or they try to push through it. And that creates a whole other, uh, you know, long drawn out process of trying to take statements from the passengers, going and visiting the chiropractor offices or health facilities to like request records to see when these people are coming in and what they're being treated for. Eventually, the outcome is to try to get them to just drop the claim. Um, and most of the time, they can prove that if it's something that cut and dry. But it, it complicates things and it drives the, the premiums up because it's like a, they're creating very dangerous situations. And they're creating an accident. Not just that, but uh, obviously it's dangerous for everybody. But in, in, when you're talking about the premium, whether they pay the claim or not, if they don't pay the claim, they're talk- you're talking about months potentially or years, I guess, yep. of up and back and people like you and people in the other departments that are doing their job and we're having to get paid. Or if yep. they write that check, then <laughs> that's just another claim payout that shouldn't have happened. So that type of fraud obviously impacts everybody in a negative way. Absolutely. How do you determine, I mean, how do you roughly again, what are some of the red flags for you to notice that that's what happened versus somebody just rear-ended someone else? A lot of times the insured, when they report the claim, will see that that's what happened. Like they won't notice it at the time. They'll, but I mean, they'll say, I was just driving on, there was like literally nothing. And then you can kind of, you just kind of get a, a sense sometimes of like, you know, how they're describing what happened. If things are just drive, they're usually on the freeway. They're moving along at a normal clip on the freeway. I shouldn't say it's all normal on the freeway. It could be anywhere. But there's no obvious reason for them to have slammed on their brakes. And it's a sudden jump in front and then stop the car and slam on the brakes. It's a very intentional act that they can see. Um, But usually the dead giveaway is you rarely get to talk to the drivers of those cars. It's almost always they have an attorney immediately and they start, sometimes they'll list three, four, five people that were in the car and our insured is saying, 
there was like one person in the car. Maybe there was someone in the front seat, but there were definitely not three more people in the back seat. That's a big red flag. And so, you know, it, we've gotten a lot more savvy about what to look for and what those red flags are. And we'll tell the attorneys off the bat, like, just so you know, the claim's been referred to the fraud department. This is what we are saying happened. It's up to you if you want to proceed with this, but this is what our process is going to be moving forward with this. And sometimes they'll drop the case because they know we're on to them. You know, it's not very smart. <laughs> it's not really a good way to do business. It's hard to imagine that this is an actual business, but I, I would yeah. suspect you probably have the same players that would also come up as well with different, uh, with, with, with oh, similar yeah. firms or similar insureds potentially. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they, I don't know if they still use this term, but they used to call them ambulance chasers, you know, like the attorneys that would kind of show up magically at the scene of an accident and like throw their cards all over the place to, to get those, the, those uh, clients. But yeah, these, you know, there's certain areas, certain attorneys, certain, um, there's certain red flags that we'll see. And, um, you know, sometimes it, it's not as obvious. It might not be, uh, they're not trying to commit fraud in the sense of being in the moment stuffing the car, but they'll send them to certain chiropractors or physical therapists that will sit like really, really pad their claims or say that they've come in for treatment three or four times a week, you know, and they're there for hours and getting this treatment and that treatment. It just doesn't sound right based on the fact that there wasn't that much damage to the car. And when they go to ask for records and then we can send them to our own doctors to be evaluated, then they back off. They're like, okay, well, this isn't going to work. The, so. the dark side of, of insurance claims. You know, doing yeah. what you do, and since you really are in a position of, of a lot of power and authority, do you, did you ever get threatened? Or what? what's this? Is there any type of security that claim adjusters have for this at work? You know, I never had anybody, like, actually threaten me. Um, you know, I did have people get very, very angry, you know, and, and yell and scream and demand to talk to a supervisor, at which point, you transfer the call or the supervisor and they're sweet as pie. They're like, you know, well, I just wanted to explain. And she went, you know, I, I actually personally never had anybody come in to like really get in my face or to threaten me in any way. Um, and again, now, because things have changed so much and so much is just done online, you know, it, it may not even be as prevalent, you know, as it used to be where we would have people physically come in, you know, to give statements. That was the, the main way we would want to deal with them. And, and back then, people would physically come in, and was there security in the building? No, we, never, we didn't have issues, but it's a very different world. <laughs> uh, uh, on that note, you're right, it is a very different world. In, in the last minute or so we've got left, what would it be if you had to give one piece of advice to someone that just was involved in some type of a loss when they're dealing, reaching out to their claims adjuster? In, in 10 or 15 seconds, what would your best advice be? I would say, even going further back than that, as soon as whatever it is has happened, if you can take pictures, some and I would love to say write down what happened so you don't forget, but if you, everyone's got a phone now, take pictures before you leave. Take pictures, you know, you don't have to post them anywhere. You don't, we're not, I'm not saying go on right on to TikTok or something, but just to jog your own memory. And it can be helpful if you have pictures of how the cars were sitting after they hit or, or thing where the, where the debris is on the road. Just... Try to take a deep breath, have all of your information in front of you, have your the, the facts straight about what happened, names of people that were in your car, names of witnesses if you have anybody, and just, you know, have realistic expectations about what's going to happen next. And just trust that you're, this person that you're going to be talking to is doing their job to try to help you. Best, best advice. Thank you so much for being here, Rachel. We appreciate all of your insight, and we will talk again soon. I hope if we can get you back here. You have been learning from Insurance Hour, and again, I'm your host, Carl Sussman. Thanks again. I do want to thank all of you for taking the time to listen today. I know insurance is not necessarily the most sexy concept. It's not the most exciting thing in the world. It is important that you understand what it is you're getting, what you should be looking for, red flags, you name it. You just need to know more than you used to. Things are more complicated than they used to be. If you have any questions, please reach out to me directly. You can email your questions to questions at insurancehour.com or call and leave a voicemail at 559 656 
educating and entertaining Californians one insurance policy at a time. This is Insurance Hour. This show is dedicated to Shamrock Papa.